Like many Americans, I've spent the past several, the past several weeks watching with interest as prominent leaders in the Democratic Party have engaged in a political foot race. They're sprinting, literally sprinting, as far left as possible, as quickly as possible, trying to outdo one another. The result is that one of our two major political parties has begun embracing one radical, half-baked socialist proposal after another. This is Mitch McConnell, for the moment the Senate Majority Leader and Chief Ghoul of the Republican Party. You may notice something strange about what he is saying, that the opposition, the Democratic Party, is radical and far-left and socialist. This is not a practice unique to Mitch McConnell, though. President Donald Trump uses the same language when referring to Democratic politicians. Let it shimmer for a little while. Let people see what radical left Democrats will do to our country. This similar language, words like extreme and radical to describe Democratic politicians, is not a coincidence, as it was and still is a planned talking point within conservative political circles and conservative news media. We begin the vetting, all this week and next, of the extreme 2020 Democratic candidates as we examine the radical views tonight of Kamala Harris, the senator from California. It's also the subject of many political attack ads against Democratic politicians. The radical left has taken over the Democratic Party, and Joe Biden is marching in lockstep with them. Notice how these pundits and attack ads paint politicians like Bernie Sanders with the same brush as establishment Democrats like Joe Biden. The goal is twofold, to make the Democratic Party in general seem too radical for moderate voters, no matter which Democrat is on the ballot, and to make Democrats like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez seem about as far left on the political spectrum as possible. This has led to bizarre takes in conservative media and the right-wing end of social media, suggesting that once the Democrats control more of the government, far-left policies are right around the corner. Republicans are always threatening us with a good time. The truth is, when Democrats have had majority control over the federal government in the past, they have enacted incremental reforms at best and have continued Republican domestic and foreign policy at worst. Propaganda that instead paints the Democratic Party as radical has been successful for the Republican Party, as recent polling shows that nearly half of all Americans believe that the Democratic Party has moved too far to the left an opinion that is incongruous with reality. The facts surrounding these duplicitous goals tell a different story. The Democratic Party is a fairly centrist political party, relative to further left political ideologies and further left political parties internationally. And politicians like Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, and others are not far-left radicals, but social democrats. Sanders calls himself a democratic socialist not a social democrat, but they are actually different, and Sanders' policy proposals are more in line with the latter, not the former. Also, he only registers as a democrat when he is running for president, and is more commonly registered as an independent. In other words, even on the fringes of the Democratic Party, they are not socialists, not radical, and by and large, not really the left. The Democratic Party's political ideology is liberalism, not socialism. A lifetime of propaganda might leave the average American with the mistaken impression that these two ideologies are one and the same, or at least similar, but they are actually opposed to one another in key ways. To understand this, we need to understand the history of liberalism, how it has been adopted and implemented by the Democratic Party, and how it has shaped the party's acceptance of and adherence to neoliberal capitalism. During the Enlightenment period in the 17th century, there was a great upheaval of new ideas in Europe, and a plucky new economic system was making the rich richer. Instilling greater and greater power among the wealthy seemed in contradiction to the more high-minded Enlightenment ideals. But not to everyone. Classical liberal philosopher John Locke saw no such contradiction, and concluded that private property, a key feature of capitalism, was connected to freedom and equality. In his second treatise on government, Locke summarized the emerging philosophy of liberalism this way. 
being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Note these important words, liberty and equal, as freedom and equality are said to be the defining characteristics of liberalism. Then there is the other, possessions or property, and in the time of this writing that included private property. Private property is not the same as personal property. Personal property is one's own belongings that can realistically be used by one person. Private property, on the other hand, is something that one person cannot realistically use by oneself and is needed by the community, like a factory. The owner of the private property hires others to do the work instead. Under capitalism, a single person can own something that the entire community needs, no matter how much that might damage the community or keep the community poor and reliant on the owner. Belief in the sanctity of this private property seems to contradict the other two defining characteristics of liberalism. For example, how much freedom exists under capitalism. Liberalism posits that capitalism allows individuals to have the freedom to make choices. What clothes to wear what food to buy, where to live, etc. Yet, freedom is a tricky concept because it contains multitudes of contradictions. Does capitalism create freedom? Certainly those with means are more free to act the more wealth that they acquire, but since capitalism establishes a hierarchy, those at the bottom of said hierarchy are certainly less free than those at the top. Liberal philosophers posit that in order for there to be freedom, people must be free to control private property. Unfortunately, another way of putting it is, in order for there to be freedom, people must be free to exploit others. They just don't phrase it that way. Instead, they say that the values of equality, freedom, and property still produce the most freedom possible, and that capitalism still offers them tremendous freedom. However, this declaration of most freedom is suspicious. The workers may have freedom to apply for a job and sell their labor to a capitalist, but if the workers don't do this, they will die. It's no choice at all. It's mandatory. Capitalism posits that workers enter freely into a contract to sell their labor, but the workers have far less negotiating power than the capitalist and must therefore work under the wage set by the capitalist, not themselves. Freedom, much like wealth, does not trickle down. To put it a simpler way, if person A gives person B the option of being harmed by a blunt instrument or a sharp instrument, person B does have the freedom to choose between the two options that person A has given them, but person B does not have the freedom to choose not to be harmed at all. Under capitalism, we only have the freedom to choose between the options that capitalists allow. And what about equality, the other important characteristic of liberalism? Capitalism is hierarchical by design, thereby creating inequality, not equality. The history of capitalism is a history of the wealthy gaining more and more, a deepening gap between wages, a coercive economic relationship between rich nations and poor nations, an existential environmental catastrophe, and the monopoly of various industries. Five corporations dominate food production, Four corporations dominate internet service, two corporations dominate retail, and one corporation dominates online retail. Jeff Bezos, the world's richest businessman, makes more money per second than the average U.S. worker makes in a week. That's not equality. Today, approximately 4.3 billion people, which is more than 60% of the world's population, live in poverty, struggling to survive on less than the equivalent of $5 per day. That's not equality either. Liberal philosophers claim that people still have the equal opportunity to gain wealth, but research shows that there are a lot of other factors that determine whether or not someone will be wealthy, besides just stick to -itiveness. If you are born into poverty, chances are very good that you will remain that way. Believing in this equality of opportunity is dependent on believing that life is fair, and we know it is not. Thus, equality of opportunity is bunk. Freedom and equality, two defining characteristics of liberalism, are hindered by the other defining quality, capitalism. In fact, one could argue that capitalism not only contradicts and hinders the other two characteristics of liberalism, but is given priority over them, because capitalism is allowed to hinder freedom and equality, but freedom and equality are not allowed to hinder capitalism. 
This is called neoliberalism, a philosophy and system that prioritizes capitalism under the belief, or perhaps pretense, that it serves the public good. In the book, A Brief History of Neoliberalism, David Harvey defined it more thoroughly. Neoliberalism is in the first instance a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. The role of the state is to create and preserve an institutional framework appropriate to such practices. Neoliberalism may be a confusing term because it was popularized in the eras of conservative leaders like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, but neoliberalism is a system maintained by both conservatives and liberals. The two ideologies have different ideas about what is the aforementioned social well-being, but they both agree that the free market is the method in which to achieve their goals and that the state's purpose is to facilitate the market. Noam Chomsky once said, Both political parties have moved to the right during the neoliberal period. Today's new Democrats are pretty much what used to be called moderate Republicans. The political revolution that Bernie Sanders called for, rightly, would not have greatly surprised Dwight Eisenhower. In the United States, the left was not only pushed out of the conversation, but eventually demonized during the Cold War. The U.S. affirmed only two political ideologies, represented by two political parties— liberalism and conservatism. In other words, the center and the right, respectively, with no real room for the left. Republicans love bringing up the fact that the Democratic Party was once the conservative party of the United States, which is the most stunning and consistent self-own in American political discourse. Republicans can't broach the subject without the implication that the former, abandoned ideology of the Democratic Party is now the ideology of the Republicans' own party today. It's an argument that more closely resembles seeing political parties as sports teams, with dynasties and important championship victories, instead of seeing political parties as entities with ideologies and agendas. It reveals a lot about whoever is delivering this bad argument more than it reveals about the Democratic Party. The change from conservatism to liberalism within the Democratic Party happened in waves, arguably beginning with public outcry about economic disparity and the, at the time, three political parties using the opportunity to side with the voters' concerns, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Progressive Party. Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, was elected president on the promise of economic reforms, The Democratic Party became the party of relief against economic hardship. This was cemented later with Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal. Finally, with Southern segregationist Democrats abandoning their party for the Republican Party, the long journey toward liberalism in the Democratic Party was complete. The Democratic Party's ideology had been firmly established as liberalism, the centrist position that advocates for equality and justice, but only as far as capitalism will allow. Nevertheless, Republican politicians frequently paint the Democratic Party as socialist, or the left, and their base parrots this ignorance. Well, what is the left? Apologies to anyone who has already read theory, but this is going to be pretty 101. Socialism is a political philosophy that posits that the means of production, distribution, and exchange ought to be collectively owned by the community. How this is accomplished depends on which form of socialism one subscribes to, but even without diving further into theory, we can already see that this is in direct opposition to liberalism because it opposes the aforementioned private ownership. Liberalism is not socialism. Communism, or a communist society, is stateless, moneyless, and classless. Communism is the eventual goal of some socialists, though not all socialists have the same goals. Anarchists also believe in a society in which what we currently consider the state is abolished. Because of this, many anarchists also consider themselves communists, or anarcho-communists. Nations like China and others have political parties called communist in their name and in aesthetic, but do not have communist societies. Social democracy, as seen in Scandinavian countries, is not actually socialism. Social democracy maintains private ownership of most of the means of production, but provides a social safety net. 
Social democracy borrows ideas from socialism and has historical connections to socialist movements, but social democracy is more like a mild compromise between socialism and capitalism that is still essentially capitalist. That is not to say that social democrats should never call themselves socialists, I am not the socialism decider, this is just some basic theory and categorization. Whether or not social democracy is part of the left alongside socialism is a matter of some debate, but that is not relevant to this exercise. In this exercise, it is only relevant that even social democracy is to the left of the Democratic Party establishment and its ideology. Socialism and communism are not liberalism, because socialism and communism oppose capitalism, whereas liberalism embraces capitalism. If you are an American and self-identify as a liberal, and you're saying, well, I'm a liberal and I don't like capitalism, then congratulations, you're not a liberal, you're a leftist. You have simply been led to believe that liberalism is just anything to the left of conservatism, the result of propaganda that obscures the political compass. This is well understood in other parts of the world. In Canada, the Liberal Party is the centrist party. To its left is the New Democratic Party, which espouses an ideology of social democracy. And to the right, the Conservative Party, which obviously espouses an ideology of conservatism. In the United Kingdom, the Liberal Democrats is the centrist party between Labour and Conservative. In Australia, the Liberal Party is basically centre-right and has a coalition with the even more right-leaning National Party. Together, they oppose the Australian Labour Party, which is to their left. Nobody mistakes liberalism for the left in these nations. In the United States, however, Republicans spread a false conception of socialism to their base that amounts to anything that is not laissez-faire capitalism, meaning capitalism that is completely devoid of economic interventionism. Economic intervention is everything from environmental regulations to protect the planet from climate change to the federal minimum wage. Republicans make American voters think socialism is when the government does stuff, and since the Democratic Party favors some common sense safety regulations, some workers' rights regulations, and some form of minimum wage, they can paint these fairly centrist policy proposals as socialism, even though that is not what the word means, and that is not where their ideology lands on the political compass. The Democratic Party is put in the unenviable position of trying to counter this propaganda by denying that it's a socialist party while trying to not explicitly state what socialism actually is. Because if they explain socialism honestly to the general population of the United States of America, then it might become popular. And they don't want that. Well, I thank you for your question, uh, but I have to say we're capitalist. And that's just the way it is. <laughs> The Democratic Party also does not want to explain socialism honestly because then Republicans will say, look, they're spreading socialist propaganda, thus defeating the whole point of the Democrats' defense against this accusation. For these reasons, the Democratic Party does not want to talk about socialism or even social democracy. Thus, the misconception that the Democratic Party is part of the left is maintained through propaganda by the Republican Party and an unwillingness to engage with socialism by the Democratic Party itself. So, with all this in mind, why is the Democratic Party so resistant to moving to the left? And is there any hope whatsoever in moving them to the left ourselves? Maintaining capitalism is the political goal of a class of people whose policies eventually benefit themselves most from that goal. Politicians go on to make big money in their career, which discourages them from doing anything that gives less power to capitalists. This has the immediate benefit to themselves as capitalists, and it maintains a relationship with wealthy capitalist donors who keep them in power. It's a never-ending cycle. Now it's more complicated than that, and involves a lot of alternate methods in which politicians make money, like speaking engagements, books, designing the laws themselves that bolster their side businesses, using classified political knowledge to better make informed business decisions, and so forth. The long and short of it is that the maintenance of capitalism is in the best interests of wealthy politicians. The Republican Party is mostly worse in this regard, but neither party is actually advocating for actual socialism that delivers real power into the hands of the workers instead of the capitalists. 
On the rare occasion that major figures appear within the Democratic Party or a caucus with the Democratic Party advocating for significant change towards at least social democracy, roadblocks are set up to slow their progress and limit their influence. You have these wings, AOC and her group on one side. It's like five people. No, it's the progressive group. It's more than well, the five. Progressive, I'm a progressive, yeah. These roadblocks come from directly within the party and indirectly through news media that also has an economic interest in the capitalist status quo. People go to cable news for their current events, for their roundtable discussions, for their punditry, and what they get is news hosted by millionaires and owned by billionaires. Because of this, the likelihood of seeing positive news coverage of a social democrat decreases, and the likelihood of seeing negative news coverage of a social democrat increases. Conservative media demonizes anything to its left, and liberal media demonizes anything to its left, even something only a little to its left, like social democracy. The most recent and obvious example of this would be news coverage of the 2020 Bernie Sanders campaign. I, Bernie Sanders makes my skin crawl, and I can't even identify for you what exactly it is. The happiest person right now, it's about 1.15 Moscow time. This thing is going very well for Vladimir Putin. I'm reading last night about the fall of France in the summer of 1940, and the general, Renault calls up Churchill and says, it's over. And Churchill said, how can it be? you got the greatest army in Europe. How can it be over? He said, it's over. So I had that suppressed feeling, I can't be as wild as Carville, but he is damn smart, and I think he's damn right on this one. I remember the Cold War. I have an attitude towards Castro. I believe if Castro and the, and the, and the Reds had won the Cold War, there would have been executions in Central Park, and I might have been one of the ones getting executed. And certain other people would be there cheering, okay? So I have a problem with people who took the other side. I don't know who Bernie, Bernie supports over these years. I don't know what he means by social. One week it's Denmark. We're going to be like Denmark. Okay, that's harmless. That's, a, that's basically a capitalist country with a lot of good social welfare programs. Denmark is harmless. It's pretty clearly in the Denmark is category, he? yeah. Are you sure? How do you know? Did he tell you that? When the Sanders campaign was on the upswing in spite of this coverage, the Democratic establishment rallied its forces to get behind Biden and to stop Sanders from securing the nomination. Now, you might be thinking, well, what can we do about it? It's good to want prescription and not only description, but the question presumes the prescriber and the listener have the same goal. If our goal is only social democracy, then supporting sock dems in elections and especially primary elections against garden variety liberals may be the best way to slowly change the ideological makeup of the Democratic Party. As challenging as that is to imagine, bear in mind that the Democratic Party has already gone through an ideological overhaul throughout the course of the past century, and it's not impossible for it to happen again with enough time, effort, and the right people. Basically, if our goal is to make the Democratic Party of the United States of America more like the new Democratic Party of Canada, then that is a difficult but theoretically achievable goal, if only for harm reduction. In the short term, we all want Medicare for All and other policies that will provide relief. If, however, our ultimate goal is a classless, stateless society, the Democratic Party or any political party will not be the entity that gives that to us. There is too much money in political parties to effectively escape capitalism exclusively through electoralism. A hypothetical, anti-capitalist, anti-statist political party in the United States cannot compete within a system it hopes to completely dismantle. See, elections are won through money, and capitalists are not going to endorse and donate to their own loss of power. Knowing this, much of our energies could be better utilized through direct action, the specifics of which will be covered in a series of future videos, but for now there is a link in the description. Goals like liberating private property simply are not the goals of the Democratic Party or even the social democracy that is desired by reformers. In conclusion, the Democratic Party's ideology is liberalism. Liberalism is centrist. Liberalism is not socialism. Liberalism is not radical. And liberalism is not the left. If we want something besides capitalism, then there is no prescription for the Democratic Party. There is only prescription for what we can do in addition to electoral politics. The right tools are needed for the right job. The Democratic Party is not the radical left, but we can be.